Chapter thirty six of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter thirty six Union Not Always Strength. The steps of the bearers, heavy and slow, the sobs of the mourners, deep and low. Shelley. At the time arranged the previous day, they set out on their walk to see Nicholas Higgins and his daughter. They both were reminded of their recent loss by a strange kind of shyness in their new habiliments, and the fact that it was the first time, for many weeks, that they had deliberately gone out together. They drew very close to each other in unspoken sympathy. Nicholas was sitting by the fireside in his accustomed corner, but he had not his accustomed pipe. He was leaning his head upon his hand, his arm resting on his knee. He did not get up when he saw them, though Margaret could read the welcome in his eyes. "'Sit ye down, sit ye down. Fire's willy out,' said he, giving it a vigorous poke, as if to turn attention away from himself. He was rather disorderly, to be sure, with a black unshaven beard of several days' growth, making his pale face look yet paler, and a jacket which would have been all the better for patching. "'We thought we should have a good chance of finding you, just after dinner-time,' said Margaret. "'We have had our sorrow, too, since we saw you,' said Mr. Hale. "'Aye, aye. Sorrow is more plentiful than dinners just now. I reckon my dinner hour stretches all o'er the day. You're pretty sure of finding me.' "'Are you out of work?' asked Margaret. "'Aye,' he replied shortly. Then after a moment's silence he added, looking up for the first time, "'I'm not wanton brass. Don't you think it? Bess, poor lass, had a little stock under her pillow, ready to slip into my hand, last moment, and Mary is fusty and cutting. But I'm out o' work, eh, the same?' "'We owe Mary some money,' said Mr. Hale, before Margaret's sharp pressure on his arm could arrest the words. "'If who takes it, I'll turn her out o' doors. I'll bide inside these four walls, and she'll bide out, that's a.' "'But we owe her many thanks for a kind service,' began Mr. Hale again. "'I ne'er thanked your daughter there for her deeds o' love to my poor wench. I ne'er could find the words. I'll have to begin and try now, if you'll start making an ado about what little Mary could sarve you.' "'Is it because of the strike you're out of work?' asked Margaret gently. "'Strike's ended. It's o'er for this time. But I'm out of work because I ne'er asked for it and I ne'er asked for it because good words is scarce, and bad words is plentiful. He was in a mood to take a surly pleasure in giving answers that were like riddles, but Margaret saw that he would like to be asked for the explanation. And good words are? Asking for work? I reckon them's almost the best words that men can say. Give me work, means, and I'll do it like a man. Them's good words. And bad words are refusing you work when you ask for it. Aye, bad words is saying, Aha, my fine chap, you've been true to your order, and I'll be true to mine. You did the best you could for them as wanted help. That's your way of being true to your kind, and I'll be true to mine. You've been a poor fool, as knowed no better, nor be a true faithful fool. So go and be damned to you. There's no work for you here. Them's bad words. I'm not a fool, and if I was, for God to hae taught me how to be wise after their fashion, I could map and hae learned if any one had tried to teach me. Would it not be worth while, said Mr. Hale, to ask your old master if he would take you back again? It might be a poor chance, but it would be a chance. He looked up again with a sharp glance at the questioner, and then tittered a low and bitter laugh. Maister, if it's no offence, I'll ask you a question or two in my turn. You're quite welcome, said Mr. Hale. I reckon yon some way of earning your bread. Folks seldom lives e Milton just for pleasure, if they can live anywhere else. You are quite right. I have some independent property, but my intention in settling in Milton was to become a private tutor. To teach folk. Well, I reckon they pay you for teaching them, don't they? Yes, replied Mr. Hale, smiling. I teach in order to get paid. And them that pays you, 
don't they tell you what to do or what not to do wi the money they give you in just payment for your pains in fair exchange like no to be sure not they do not say you may have a brother or a friend as dear as a brother who wants this here brass for a purpose both you and he think is right but your men promise not to give it to him your men say a good use as you think to put your money to but we don't think it good and so if you spend it at that ends we'll leave off dealing with you they do not say that don't they no to be sure not would you stand for it if they did it would be some very hard pressure that would make me even think of submitting to such dictation there's not the pressure on all the broad earth that would make me said nicholas higgins now you've got it you've hit the bull's eye hampers that's where i worked makes their men pledge themselves they'll not give a penny to help the union or keep turnouts from clemen they may pledge and make pledge continued he scornfully they nubbit make liars and hypocrites and that's a lesson to my mind to make a men's hearts so hard that they'll not do a kindness to them as needs it or help on the right and just cause though it goes again the strong hand but i'll never forswear myself for a the work the king could gi me i'm a member o the union and i think it's the only thing to do the workmen any good and i've been a turnout and known what it were to clem so if i get a shilling sixpence shall go to them if they ax it from me consequence is i dunnot see where i'm to get a shilling is that rule about not contributing to the union in force at all the mills asked margaret i cannot say it's a new regulation at Ourn, and I reckon they'll find that they cannot stick to it. But it's in force now. By and by they'll find out. Tyrants make liars. There was a little pause. Margaret was hesitating whether she should say what was in her mind. She was unwilling to irritate one who was already gloomy and despondent enough. At last it came out, but in her soft tones and with her reluctant manner, showing that she was unwilling to say anything unpleasant it did not seem to annoy higgins only to perplex him do you remember poor boucher saying that the union was a tyrant i think he said it was the worst tyrant of all and i remember at the time i agreed with him it was a long time before he spoke he was resting his head on his two hands and looking down into the fire so she could not read the expression on his face i'll not deny but what the union finds it necessary to force a man into his own good i'll speak truth a man leads a dree life who's not e the union but once e the union his interests are taken care on better nor he could do it for himself or by hisself for that matter it's the only way working men can get their rights by all joining together more the members more chance for each one separate man having justice done him government takes care o fools and madmen and if any man is inclined to do hisself or his neighbour a hurt it puts a bit o check on him whether he likes it or no that's all we do e the union we can't clap folks into prison but we can make a man's life so heavy to be borne that he's obliged to come in and be wise and helpful in spite of himself boucher were a fool all along and ne'er a worse fool than at the last he did you harm asked margaret ay that he did we had public opinion on our side till he and his sort began riotin and breakin laws it were all o'er with the strike then then would it not have been far better to have left him alone and not forced him to join the union he did you no good and you drove him mad margaret said her father in a low and warning tone for he saw the cloud gathering on higgins's face i like her said higgins suddenly who speaks plain out what's on her mind who doesn't comprehend the union for all that it's a great power it's our only power i hear read a bit of poetry about a plough going o'er a daisy as made tears come into my eyes afore i'd other cause for crying but the chap ne'er stopped driving the plough i's warrant for all he were pitiful about the daisy he'd too much mother wit for that the union's the plough makin ready the land for harvest time such as boucher twould be settin him up too much to liken him to a daisy 
he's liker a weed lounging over the ground mun just make up their mind to be put o the way i'm sore vexed with him just now so mappen i dunnot speak him fairer i could go o'er him with a plough myself with a the pleasure in life why what has he been doing anything fresh ay to be sure he's ne'er out o mischief that man first of a he must go raging like a mad fool and kick up yon riot then he'd go into hiding where he'd a been yet if thornton had followed him out as i'd hoped he would a done but thornton having got his own purpose didn't care to go on with the prosecution of the riot so boucher slunk back again to his house he ne'er showed himself abroad for a day or two he had that grace and then where do you think he went why to hampers damn him he went with his mealy-mouthed face that turns me sick to look at a askin for work though he knowed well enough the new rule a pledging themselves to get naught to the unions not to help the starving turnout why he'd a clemmed to death if the union had nay helped him in his pinch there he went ossin to promise aught and pledge himself to aught to tell a he knowed on our proceedings the good for nothing judas but i'll say this for hamper and thank him for it at my dying day he drove boucher away and would nay listen to him ne'er a word though folk standing by says the traitor cried like a babby oh how shocking how pitiful exclaimed margaret higgins i don't know you to-day don't you see how you've made boucher what he is by driving him into the union against his will without his heart going with it you have made him what he is made him what he was what was he gathering gathering along the narrow street came a hollowed measured sound now forcing itself on their attention many voices were hushed and low many steps were heard not moving onwards at least not with any rapidity or steadiness of motion but as if circling round one spot yes there was one distinct slow tramp of feet which made itself a clear path through the air and reached their ears the measured labored walk of men carrying a heavy burden they were all drawn towards the house door by some irresistible impulse impelled thither not by a poor curiosity but as if by some solemn blast six men walked in the middle of the road three of them being policemen they carried a door taken off its hinges upon their shoulders on which lay some dead human creature and from each side of the door there were constant droppings all the street turned out to see and seeing to accompany the procession each one questioning the bears who answered almost reluctantly at last so often had they told the tale we found to me the brook by the field beyond there the brook why there's not water enough to drown him he was a determined chap he lay with his face downwards he was sick enough o livin choose what cause he had for it higgins crept up to margaret's side and said in a weak piping kind of voice it's not john boucher he'd any spunk enough sure it's not john boucher why they are looking this way listen i have a singing in my head and i cannot hear they put the door down carefully upon the stones and all might see the poor drowned wretch his glassy eyes one half open staring right upwards to the sky owing to the position in which he had been found lying his face was swollen and discoloured besides his skin was stained by the water in the brook which had been used for dyeing purposes the fore part of his head was bald but the hair grew thin and long behind and every separate lock was a conduit for water through all these disfigurements margaret recognized john boucher it seemed to her so sacrilegious to be peering into that poor distorted agonized face that by a flash of instinct she went forwards and softly covered the dead man's countenance with her handkerchief the eyes that saw her do this followed her as she turned away from her pious office and were thus led to the place where nicholas higgins stood like one rooted to the spot the men spoke together and then one of them came up to higgins 
who would have fain shrunk back into his house. Higgins, thou knowed him. Thou mun go tell the wife. Do it gently, man, but do it quick, for we cannot leave him here long. I cannot go, said Higgins. Do not ask me. I cannot face her. Thou knowest her best, said the man. We'n done a deal in bringing him here. Thou take thy share. I cannot do it, said Higgins. I'm Willie Feld, we see in him. We wasn't friends, and now he's dead. Well, if thou won it, thou won it. Some one mun, though. It's a dree task, but it's a chance every minute, as she doesn't hear it in some rougher way, nor a person going to make her let on by degrees, as it were. Papa, do you go, said Margaret in a low voice. If I could, if I had time to think of what I had better say, but all at once. Margaret saw that her father was indeed unable. He was trembling from head to foot. I will go, said she. Bless you, miss. It will be a kind act, for she's been a sickly sort of body, I hear, and a few hereabouts know much on her. Margaret knocked at the closed door, but there was such a noise as of many little ill-ordered children, that she could hear no reply. Indeed, she doubted if she was heard, and as every moment of delay made her recoil from her task more and more, she opened the door and went in, shutting it after her, and even, unseen to the woman, fastening the bolt. Mrs. Boucher was sitting in a rocking-chair on the other side of the ill-read-up fireplace. It looked as if the house had been untouched for days by any effort at cleanliness. Margaret said something. She hardly knew what. Her throat and mouth were so dry, and the children's noise completely prevented her from being heard. She tried again. "'How are you, Mrs. Boucher? But very poorly, I'm afraid.' "'I've no chance of being well,' she said querulously. "'I'm left alone to manage these childer, and not for to give em for to keep em quiet. John should they have left me, and me so poorly.' How long is it since he went away? Four days sin. No one would give him work here, and he'd to go on tramp toward Greenfield. But he might have been back afore this, or sent me some word if he'd gotten work. He might— Oh, don't blame him, said Margaret. He felt it deeply, I'm sure. Will to hold thy din, and let me hear the lady speak— addressing herself, in no very gentle voice, to a little urchin of about a year old. She apologetically continued to Margaret. "'He's always mitherin for Daddy and Butty, and I have no butties to give him, and Daddy's away, and forgettin' us, eh, I think. He's his father's darling, he is,' said she, with a sudden turn of mood, and, dragging the child up to her knee, she began kissing it fondly. Margaret laid her hand on the woman's arm to arrest her attention. Their eyes met. "'Poor little fellow,' said Margaret slowly. "'He was his father's darling.' "'He is his father's darling,' said the woman, rising hastily, and standing face to face with Margaret. Neither of them spoke for a moment or two. Then Mrs. Boucher began in a low, growling tone, gathering in wildness as she went on. "'He is his father's darling, I say.' Poor folk can love their children as well as rich. Why don't you speak? Why don't you stare at me? We are great pitiful eyes. Where's John? Weak as she was, she shook Margaret to force out an answer. Oh, my God, said she, understanding the meaning of that tearful look. She sank back into the chair. Margaret took up the child and put him into her arms. He loved him, said she. Ay, said the woman, shaking her head. He loved us, eh? We had some one to love us once. It's a long time ago. But when he were in life and with us, he did love us, he did. He loved this bappy mappin the best on us. But he loved me, and I loved him, though I was calling him five minutes agone. Are you sure he's dead? said she, trying to keep up. If it's only that he's ill and like to die— they may bring him round yet. But I'm an ailing creature, Missel, and I've been ailing this long time. But he is dead. 
he is drowned folks are brought round after they're dead drowned what was i thinking of to sit still when i should be stirring myself here whist thee child whist thee take this take aught to play with but don't a cry while my heart's breaking oh where's my strength gone to oh john husband margaret saved her from falling by catching her in her arms she sat down in the rocking-chair and held the woman upon her knees her head lying on margaret's shoulder the other children clustered together in a fright began to understand the mystery of the scene but the ideas came slowly for their brains were dull and languid of perception they set up such a cry of despair as they guessed the truth that margaret knew not how to bear it johnny's cry was loudest of them all though he did not know why he cried poor little fellow the mother quivered as she lay in margaret's arms margaret heard a noise at the door open it open it quick she said to the eldest child it's bolted make no noise be very still oh papa let them go upstairs very softly and carefully and perhaps she will not hear them she has fainted that's all it was well for her poor creature said a woman following in the wake of the bearers of the dead but you're not fit to hold her stay i'll fetch a pillow and we'll let her down easy on the floor this helpful neighbor was a great relief to margaret she was evidently a stranger to the house a newcomer in the district indeed but she was so kind and thoughtful that margaret felt she was no longer needed and that it would be better perhaps to set an example of clearing the house which was filled with idle if sympathizing gazers she looked round for nicholas higgins he was not there she spoke to the woman who had taken the lead in placing mrs boucher on the floor can you give all these people a hint that they had better leave in quietness so that when she comes round she should only find one or two that she knows about her papa will you speak to the men and get them to go away she cannot breathe poor thing with this crowd about her margaret was kneeling down by mrs boucher and bathing her face with vinegar but in a few minutes she was surprised at the gush of fresh air she looked round and saw a smile pass between her father and the woman what is it she asked only our good friend here replied her father hit on a capital expedient for clearing the place i bid em be gone and each take a child with him and to mind that they were orphans and their mother a widow it was who could do most and the children are sure of a bellyful to-day and of kindness too does who know how he died no said margaret i could not tell her all at once who mun be told because of the inquest see who's coming round shall you or i do it or mappin your father would be best no you you said margaret they awaited her perfect recovery in silence then the neighbor woman sat down on the floor and took mrs boucher's head and shoulders on her lap neighbor said she your man's dead guess you how he died he were drowned said mrs boucher feebly beginning to cry for the first time at this rough probing of her sorrows he were found drowned he were coming home very hopeless so aught on earth he thought god could nay be harder than men mappin not so hard mappin as tender as a mother mappin tenderer i'm not saying he did right i'm not saying he did wrong all i say is may neither me nor mine ever have his sore heart or we may do like things he has left me alone with a these children moaned the widow less distressed at the manner of death than margaret expected but it was of a piece with her helpless character to feel his loss as principally affecting herself and her children not alone said mr hale solemnly who is with you who will take up your cause the widow opened her eyes wide and looked at the new speaker of whose presence she had not been aware till then who has promised to be a father to the fatherless continued he but i've gotten six children sir and the eldest not eight years of age i'm not meaning for to doubt his power sir but it only needs a deal of trust and she began to cry afresh who will be better able to talk to-morrow sir said the neighbor best comfort now would be the feel of a child at her heart i'm sorry they took the babby i'll go for it said margaret 
and in a few minutes she returned, carrying Johnny, his face all smeared with eating, and his hands loaded with treasures in the shape of shells and bits of crystal, and the head of a plaster figure. She placed him in his mother's arms. "'There,' said the woman. "'Now you go. They'll cry together, and comfort together, better nor any one but child can do. I'll stop with her as long as I'm needed, and if you'll come to-morrow, you can have a deal of wise talk with her that she's not up to to-day.' As Margaret and her father went slowly up the street, she paused at Higgins's closed door. "'Shall we go in?' asked her father. "'I was thinking of him, too.' They knocked. There was no answer, so they tried the door. It was bolted, but they thought they heard him moving within. "'Nicholas!' said Margaret. But there was no answer, and they might have gone away, believing the house to be empty, if there had not been some accidental fall as of a book, within. Nicholas said Margaret, "'It is only us. Won't you let us come in?' "'No,' said he. "'I spoke as plain as I could, about using words, when I bolted the door. Let me be, this day.' Mr. Hale would have urged their desire, but Margaret placed her finger on her lips. "'I don't wonder at it,' said she. "'I myself long to be alone.' It seems the only thing to do one good after a day like this. End of chapter 36